Okay, sorry guys. Hopefully it'll come up later and I'll get it. Um, I'll figure it out, but right now I can't do that. So welcome if you just have joined or you've been on for a while as I'm trying to figure it out. We did a run through on Friday and then we did another run through um, this morning and it worked perfectly. And now it's not, so it's not helping me. <laughs> And what I hate is because I can't see it, it looks like that I'm looking up at you guys. But we'll see, we'll go for um, with that. So this is our, um, I wanna see here, let me see what some of the uh, answers were in the chat. Um, can I actually pull this up? Okay, I'll figure that out later. But as you can see here, we are gonna be talking, um, I'm not gonna do a introduction as far as have everyone you know, say who they are, um, just for the sake of time. But I am going to just get a feel for who's in the room. And then we'll of course start out with the baseline of, um, we'll start out with the baseline of you know, buildings and what the Bible says about that. And then we'll look at how church can be done differently and looking at our building and ministry. So um, I want to um, uh, be able to go through with you with all of this today. Again, like I said, we'll have time for questions. And I also have a resource page um, that will be important. One of the things too is, and I don't know if it's being recorded right now, but this is being recorded. And hopefully it's just not starting to be recorded since I was having problems getting on. Uh, but it's going to be recorded so you will have access um, to be able to view this again. So if that means for you not to have to sit and try to take uh, pictures or write down um, everything that's being said, then that will be okay because you will have a copy of this. So let me tell you a little bit about who I am. Um, can you guys see right now the welcome screen? Yes. Okay. Is, is that all you see? Yes. Yes. The welcome slide. Okay. So, um, so one of the things, let me, let me tell you who I am. I am um, Vice President for Building and Capital Services, and I have been serving Disciples Church Extension Fund for coming up almost nine years. And so I will, um, I cover over nine regions. And so those include you guys, Tennessee, it includes capital area, it includes um, Ohio, Canada, Northeastern, Pennsylvania, Virginia, and West Virginia. So a lot of um, states that I cover along the way. So um, one of the things is that I not, not only serve um, as vice president for Disciples Church Extension Fund, I am very active in my congregation as well. I have served Light of the World Christian Church um, for the past 30 years in various capacities from treasurer to um, uh, secretary to everything. I just Sunday school teacher. And then I have also served our Indiana region as well, both on the finance board and the uh, the general board for Indiana. I currently now serve um, for Fellowship of Black Disciples Clergy Women, and I also serve for National Convocation currently right now in the greater church. So just to give you an idea. So this is going to be hard because I can't really see all of you guys. Let me see if it's a way I can do this. So just with the show of hands, um, let me know how many pastors do we have on, on the Zoom today. You can just raise your hand. Okay, I'm switching between the screens. All right, I see two. Hi, Ron. <laughs> All right, and then how many uh, treasurers do I have? Uh-oh, I lost my screen. Any treasurers on the line? <laughs> Mara, is that how you say it? Mara? Mara is correct. Okay, I had it right the first time. Okay, uh, how many building committee? Because we're talking about buildings, I would imagine people on the on the call are 
somewhere doing something with buildings in their churches. No building people? No building committee people? Okay, there's Bob. We have one. Okay, how about um, uh, lay leaders? Janice and Bob again and Clyde. Hi, Clyde. Uh, and uh, who else? I didn't see. Okay. And then last but definitely not least, um, just you're just a member of the church and you want to be here just to find out what's happening. You want to hear what all this is about. Yay! Welcome, everyone. I just wanted to get an idea of who all are. So I have a mixture about a little bit of everything. So that's great. That makes it wonderful for interaction and questions that get asked, because we're always going to ask questions from where um, our source uh, of understanding is at. So I'm going to decrease this again so it won't be in my way. All right, so let's go to the next slide. And oh, I want to really see, Chris, you want to share with me real quick some of the things that people said because for some reason i am not being able to and i am sure it is the operator um of not being able to see what some of the answers were on what people want to learn because i want to definitely make sure i i take care of that for everyone all right um let's see uh janice martin says new ideas julia says good morning meaning practical advice for the local congregation to keep connected um, Bob says guidance on how to reopen church safely, what parameters should be used. Julie says, I'd like to take away collective ideas or experiences from other churches and how to be church for our congregation, how to care for our church community when so many of our normal ways of care are off the table. Deborah says ideas and options, how to be church in today's environment. Dennis, I would like to have some ideas on moving beyond the church building and reaching into the community. Ron, I would like to see that what we are doing is comparable to the efforts of others and to find new ways to continue an online presence and safe in-person worship as we resume services. Um, Clyde, maintaining connectivity and relationships during this season. There you go, Ms. Blundell. Great. Thank you. I appreciate that. All right. Um, so... Can you guys see the next slide? Well, probably not because. You're still seeing the agenda, right? Correct. Here we are back to the beginning again. Okay, there we go. All right, so what does, you do see what does the Bible say about buildings, church buildings, correct? Yes. Okay. Correct. So ironically, there are over a hundred scriptures in the Bible around church buildings. They, they actually don't say church buildings. It's identified in the Bible as temples or as tents or just worshiping in the wilderness but i chose a couple because you guys don't want to sit here and have me go over a hundred scriptures nor do i want to do that so i just chose a a, a couple of scriptures that um, stood out for me and that is matthew 18 20 as you can see on the screen for where two or three are gathered in my name there i am um, there am i with them and so that's important. We, we know that during this time, we may have been worshiping in smaller groups. Um, we may have been worshiping from our homes, obviously from our homes or from coffee shops or wherever that may be. And so God is everywhere and we figured that out. Um, the other one is Matthew 16, 18. And on this rock, will I build my church? And so I just want to kind of set the groundwork to say, that church is us, we know that. We've learned that maybe the hard way through COVID, but we do know that church is about us and who and serving from wherever we are at. So let's go to the next slide. And so I want you to, you don't have to answer these questions uh, with me, but I want you to ponder on these questions. 
And so, um, would you consider yours, your congregation, adequate or inadequate in these areas? So we see website. Um, is it updated? Actually, you know what? I'm sorry, I didn't put it up. Okay, now can you see that? <laughs> is your website updated? Does it reflect? Currently right now, if I was to go to either one of your websites, would it reflect that you are currently closed if you are closed and you're worshiping online and how to actually be able to access online? Does it have your hours of, of worship? Um, I have, just to tell you a little bit um, about me, I have three children. One is a millennial and two are Generation Z, which is a whole nother animal. We thought millennials were out there. Z's have a whole different way of church and doing just things in general. But my millennial, um, could she, she went to University of Missouri. And so when she went to college, one of the things that um, her dad and I said is that we want to make sure that you are grounded and that you find a church home locally in Missouri where you are at. And so she did that. Um, and so the first thing she did, millennial style, is go to the website and make sure uh, and look for a church. And it was ironic, the things that she came back and told me. And so when she said that, um, I started sharing it with our churches because what she found out is she could not, she could find churches on the website, but they didn't have their addresses listed. They didn't have their time of services listed. They didn't show any kind of life um, that's happening in their church, like they are doing things in their community or they're doing things in their church. And so again, I ask you, think about your website. Is it adequate or inadequate? Signage, um, let's just talk about that a little bit. So I have a colleague, Jim Michael, and I hopefully will be able to show you guys at the end of this, um, the section where you can access all of our blogs. He did a blog. Uh, called Signs of the Time. And that was probably maybe three weeks ago or so. And so then that is his pet peeve, is signage. He's our building um, evaluation person. And so one of the things um, that he states in his Signs of the Times is signage is so important. Why? Because it starts not even when you enter the church or it starts actually when you're driving up to the church. If your church is not somewhere where it's visible to the crowd or visible to the street, then you need to be able to have signage for people to even know where to find you at. And then within that signage, once they get up to the church, and I can attest to this in visiting hundreds of churches over the last nine years, thousands actually. Um, and sometimes I pull up to a church and I can't even tell you where the front door is at. I don't know where to enter the church at. So I'm dialing the pastor or texting, how do I get in? So, you know, is your signage adequate or inadequate? And so during this time, obviously in COVID, if you are already open, one of the things that's going to be important is to have signage in how to enter. Are you going, one person going in this way, one door is going the other way six feet, reminding people the six feet, distance, all of those things. Building safety, you know, obviously, you know, we want to um, look at is that adequate or inadequate, not only now in COVID time, but before. Outside curb repeal, it is so crucial. Um, is your, your outside curb repeal adequate or inadequate? Your ministry offerings, what are you offering to your community? What are you offering within your church that keeps me wanting to come back? What um, does your building actually match your ministry? Or even, and we're gonna talk about this, or does your building not even serve your ministry? Like you have a love for um, sharing and doing food banks, and but you don't have an adequate kitchen to be able to do that or adequate space to be able to do that. So. Just something to think about and ponder on. So let's go to the next slide. Is your building a blessing or a curse? Let me pull up. And Chris, if anyone's asking any questions or anyone have any questions, 
I cannot see me or anyone else for whatever reason. And so just um, speak up, take yourself off of mute, or Chris, let me know if people were raising their hands. Um, Will do. So, thank you. All right. So, um, so is your building a blessing or a curse? One of the things is, of course, our, our, our building is a blessing, but it can also be a curse. And so, as you can see here on some of the um, screen here is, our building allows us to do the ministry that we are called to do in our facility within the community actually that we serve. And so one of the things is prayers. Think about prayers have been answered at altars or circle of prayers um, or, you know, prayer cloths within our buildings, marriages. A lot of people have been married in their churches. Of course, I was married in a church. And so that you know, uh, our, our buildings are blessings from that. Births, births have happened. Um, you know, actually that millennial that I was talking about, because we could not do church, do church uh, marriages and open up our churches, she was to get married uh, October 17th and it got postponed because she wants to do it in a building. And currently our church is not open. Um, and so births, Babies have been Christian. They've been, some have literally been born in the church. And then unfortunately, yes, deaths have happened as well of our loved ones, but to have a facility to be able to have a, a celebration of the life of our loved ones in a church um, is huge. Obviously, baptisms has happened, healing. People have been prayed over. People have went up to the altar and asked, you know, I'm having surgery or pray for uh, my family member who just got diagnosed. So these are all things and then absolutely being able to feed the community. All of these things are things that we have been able to do in our buildings, which therefore makes that a blessing. So, of course, our buildings um, can be a curse. And so what does that look like? Uh, let me bring those up. So some of the things that we can do is idolize our buildings internally. But I know no one on this call does that. But we have some of our churches that our, our buildings have basically become their God. They don't want to invite outsiders for the fear that they'll mess up the paint. They'll mess up the carpet. No, we can't have children. We can't have vacation Bible school. We can't have all those things in our church because it's going to mess up our church. And so that's when we begin to idolize and make our church a curse. Um, and then our favorite at Disciples Church Extension Fund, which we experience this a lot when we're talking with churches around building projects, is build it and they will come. So as you can see the pictures on here, you know, you have, um, and I don't know, you probably can't see me pointing at this, but you have the top right church that has beautiful ceilings and pillars and just, it's just a gorgeous church. And then um, the church in the lower left, you know, is a big church, it's beautiful and stained glass. So one of the things that someone has said to me, and I had never looked at it like that, actually it was a Tennessee church because I was visiting this church with um, uh, Reverend Dr. Crystal Williams. And we were talking about how gorgeous the stained glass was. But then that person actually said, yes, but unfortunately that stained glass can only be seen from the inside, not the outside. And I had never even looked at it like that. Stained glass windows are beautiful. They are beautiful in churches. But, you know, having stained glass when we have those, not saying it's bad to have stained glass, but it is self-serving inside because we see the beauty inside, not the outside world. And then, of course, um, the uh, so building and they will come is when churches look at, I want my building to be beautiful, state of the art, able to have all of the, the modern things. However, they may build a three, 400 seat sanctuary 
but have 50 members. And so if we build this state-of-the-art building, we definitely will be able to have people come and they will come just because our building is beautiful. And we know, yes, they will come, but will they stay? Because it's what we do as a church and the ministries that we do is what allows people and make them stay. Um, and then building maintenance, obviously these buildings are huge and sometimes can be a curse because we have to continue to do annual checkups just like we do our own bodies. We have to take maintenance drugs, uh, supplements, uh, pills and vitamins and things like that to keep our own natural bodies. And so we have to do that same thing with our buildings um, annually and monthly and things like that. And actually one of the things, um, just to let you know, it, within Disciples Church Extension Fund, we actually offer building evaluation services that is coordinated and led by Jim, um, who did the Signs of the Time blog that I was mentioning, where um, that service identifies the life of your building. It identifies and looks at everything from the steeple all the way to the crawl space um, and how you know, how long your boiler will last, uh, putting a maintenance schedule together, you know, the condition of your HVAC, all of those things are part of that service. So just wanted to share that. All right. It's time to get a little bit of interaction. I feel like I've been doing a lot of talking. So, um, and I'm so at a disadvantage. I hate this is not showing the way we practice it, um, but I'm able to see you guys. And so let me pull up this audience poll and I'm going to have you guys to put in the chat because I think it's important for us to also learn from each other is what are some of the things that your church or even maybe your community, maybe your church is not doing it, but you've seen other churches or, or the organizations in your community um, done some things to use their building during COVID um, pandemic time. So if you can list some of those things in the chat, we would love to be able to hear some of those things. Can't see, Chris, if anyone's put anything in the chat, but as they come in, if you can read them for me, that would be great. Sure will. So one of the things why, um, um, people are hopefully typing some things in is, you know, I've seen some drive-ins, um, churches have done drive-ins. And actually I like to mention this church, um, I'm not sure if you guys are familiar, it's a Disciples of Christ Church, obviously, uh, out of Daytona Beach, Florida. And they are literally called the drive-in church, Daytona Beach Drive-In Church. And they have been conducting drive-in forever. They, they started and existed as a drive-in church. And so, and they are very successful. They have done actually three projects with us from a building perspective because they have continued to grow and they've had to change their platform and their elevation of how they deliver it. But in the drive-in church, what they do is it's kind of like you go into the drive-in or you're going into a museum or the zoo or anything like that. Well, when you come through the front gate, you know, they're given their elements, um, they're giving um, their tides. Uh, envelopes, and they're given a program if, uh, if people so choose. And then literally all of the people are on a stage, on a drive through They have this big building. Um, if I would have thought about it, I could have made a, did a picture and inserted it so you guys could see it. Didn't think about that. Um, but it's a beautiful uh, church. Actually, our own um, Office and General Minister President, Reverend Terry um, Horde, actually got to speak at that church. So, um, so they're looking at, I've been doing drive-in forever. Um, some other things is some churches have opened up their church to do blood drives, to do COVID testing, um, obviously um, food banks and um, food giveaways. And then now that we're in back to school season, we have seen churches do book bag giveaways as well. Belinda, we have some answers. All right, great. Let's hear them. Um, from Bob, we have First Christian Chattanooga is not using its building at all other than for routine office tasks due to COVID. The more people are in the building, the less safe it is. 
Uh, let's see, from Ron, we have using the outdoor amphitheater for scouts, youth, etc. streaming worship services, using our portico as a collection point for lunches we take downtown every Wednesday for people experiencing homelessness. Ooh. Um, from Julie, we don't use our building at all because of safety concerns and national regulations. We have our security in the office and sometimes our ministry staff, but no one else. From Bethany Hills, since Bethany Hills is closed for the last six months, we will be at least until the last of October, we are looking to start and serve as a food pickup ministry. Um, from Clyde, distributed communion, provided meals for seniors, back to school supplies provided for at-risk children. We also continued our Manor outreach program. Uh, from Bob, FCC Chattanooga is contemplating a parking lot service in early November, obviously outside the building, not inside. Julie, the exception has been a walkthrough communion service and outdoor fellowship. We do a couple of times a month. Uh, from Julia, our church is undergoing building renovations. So live stream worship on Sundays from front of sanctuary is only building use. Uh, from Mara, we have opened by removing chairs from sanctuary with only 20 in service. We have opened up fellowship hall to artists, only five and rotary less than 10. That's what we got. Great, thank you. So I wanna, uh, Mar made me think of something. Um, so she just said, you guys have opened. So I just, let me uh, take a hand poll or a reaction poll to see how many have actually opened um, and are doing um, church service at a limited uh, capacity, obviously, but how many have done that already? So I'm seeing one, two, just two, okay. Ron and Mar. Wow. Okay. So that, I mean, and I'm one of those people who we have not opened yet. Actually, they're talking about, my husband serves on that committee, um, is talking about it may not be until next year. So I don't know. I can't remember the name you told me who talked about the walkthrough communion service. If they don't mind talking, tell me just a little bit more about that. Hi, that was me. This is Julie. I'm at Eastwood Christian Church in Nashville. Actually, I didn't raise my hand for any of your questions. Um, I'm not a, a minister, but we're in between a settled pastor. We're, we're done with our interim, but we don't have our settled pastor yet. So I'm working as the operations manager, um, just running the, the ministerial st part-time staff that we have and making sure everything gets done. But we, um, we're we doing a walkthrough communion where um, we you know, turn on the air conditioning and we bought a bunch of easels and big postery kinds of things and um, basically put the words of institution um, kind of on the kind of as you walk down into you know our main aisle um, you can read the words of institution as you walk up towards the um, the communion table where we have out our different communion kind of as a self-serve thing and with one of our ministerial staff at a distance everyone has masks on, all the doors are open, and they come forward and we have a musician, like our organist, playing. Um, and it's just kind of an open house thing where you walk through and the, the ministerial staff says um, a blessing and you pick up the communion and you take it and walk out the side door. We have an offering bowl because some people miss giving their offering at, at the church, you know, the sanctuary. And um, they take it outside, then they can remove their mask and take communion. And then they put their mask back on. And then we have kind of an outdoor um, fellowship time where people can just stand around and talk as long as they're distanced from each other. Um, so we have found that that is both kind of really um, healing because we're able to be together, but it's also safe. We can walk through the sanctuary, which we really miss, but we're not staying inside. So that also seems pretty safe. So. And we're also in conjunction with that delivering communion at home for the people who even that doesn't feel safe. Hey, that is awesome. I like that. Yeah, I, I wanted to hear more. That is a oh, wow. That's so I'm going to obviously, you know, I'm going to steal that and, and talk about that and say, you know, the church is doing that. So thank you so much for sharing. All right. Okay. I got to hurry along. I'm like starting late, kind of got us on a different, um, Got me started late. Let me get to the next screen. I'm operating on two screens in case you haven't figured that out. <laughs> um, and then let me lower you guys back so that I can actually see my screen. So you should have up there opening 
safely, some things to consider. Can you guys see that? Is that a yes, Chris? <laughs> yes. Okay, thank you. So some things to consider is obviously planning and preparation, um, and which is important. Um, one of my favorite scriptures that if you go to everything I ever do throughout the life of the church, I am at some point going to always bring up this scripture. And that's a back or two into one of my favorite scriptures um, um, to write a vision and make it plain. And so it's, it's just planning, writing that vision and what are we wanting to accomplish. And so one of the things is obviously doing some deep cleaning and, and not just preferably, not just deep cleaning um, where people are coming in and are masked up and using, which that is okay too, don't get me wrong, but to really check into doing some professional deep cleaning. And those companies are booming just right about now. One of the things that I will say, and you're going to see this, basically really um, all of these things that you see really here on this screen are going to be in the resource page on the last page or close to the last page of this presentation, because there is actually a link uh, from CDC and how church buildings should prepare their church um, for cleaning. Um, and so you will be able to see that in the resource and click on that link and see boom, 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 like literally outlined. There's a lot of information um, out there, but definitely making sure you're, you're cleaning your, um, your uh, facility. Um, signage, again, there is Jim mentioned in his Signs of the Time blog, um, signage, one of the things that he mentioned that um, I think will be very helpful for many churches um, who maybe cannot afford to go in and go to like, uh, I'm trying to think of Kinko's or something like that and get plastic signs and all those things um, done. And so uh, he included a link in his blog that allows you to get free sign templates. And basically what it is, is your social distance social distancing signs, you know, your wash your hands for 20 seconds signs and all those kind of signs. And they're nice, they're professional, they're color. And the only thing the church really will have to have is access to a printer and colored cardstock. Um, and so they've done the work of creating the template and all you have to do is literally just print it off. And so you will be able to click on, he has that link in there, click in there and actually look at all of the different templates and use for your church. Um, supplies, obviously making sure that, you know, masks are available, uh, individual communion um, is available. Most churches, although some churches have always done individual, my churches has been one of those, but a lot of churches and um, that I attend usually have where one person stands at the front with the cup and the other person stands uh, with the bread and people pinch off the bread and dip it in the cup and then um, be on their way. Obviously we can't do that in COVID time. Um, and so uh, making sure that people have individual communions, gloves, you know, hand sanitizers, those are things that you have to decide. Will we require, uh, will we give gloves if people warm? Will we provide hand sanitizer upon entering to church and on leaving the church? obviously caution tape or signage or things like that where you're roping off the six uh, feet distance as well as um, you know how far six feet is when you're uh, maybe going to drop off your offering because that should not be passed obviously throughout um, the, the pews and actually this is one of those things when you have a big church and you have small members uh, it may be a little bit more easier to do social distancing within your church because you may have a 200 seat uh, sanctuary and have 50 members. And so you can pretty much almost have probably all of your, your um, actual members come back if they so choose to be able to do that. And then obviously technology, um, having TV monitors in separate rooms because you may not, most churches will not be able to um, when they uh, get to either half capacity or even full capacity, be able to social distance and be all in one room. And so the monitors would be a way to be able to reduce 
um, that number, um, whether that's in the fellowship hall, overflow areas, obviously internet grade um, upgrade. Um, that was huge. We had to, we actually created a loan, uh, emergency loan situation for churches because when churches had to pivot very quickly um, to be able to do that, they obviously had to upgrade their, their internet and um, having extra microphones so that one person is not um, handling the same microphone during that, that time because it's uh, difficult to uh, possibly sanitize that microphone in between. Um, so those kind of things, recording equipment, and, um, and then things um, of what you need in order for when people are in person, um, how you will be able to do your technology around that. So um, as far as singers, those kind of things around technology and recording, maybe recording some of the music ahead of time, uh, or only having one to three singers as opposed to the entire choir singing. So those are just some things to kind of think about um, in, in um, opening safely. I don't know if I have any questions, uh, Chris. All right, we'll go to the next. Yeah, there's a question from Bob. Citation to blog, please. Yes, I am going, well, let me tell you what it is. It is disciplescef.org. Chris, if you don't mind, if you can just type that into the chat, disciplescef, which the C and the E and the F stands for Church Extension Fund, but disciplescef.org. Actually, do I dare get out and show you? Um, I'll try that at the end because I don't want to mess up that I get out and then I can't get back in. <laughs> and then I can't get back to my presentation. But if you go into our website, that's our website, there at the very top when you come in, you will see it in the blue ribbon blog. And uh, then you click on blog and it will have every blog that we've done, including some of the ones that I have done as well, which I just recently done. I think someone said they wanted to learn about engaging. I just did our blog last Tuesday on how to do online engagement because it's exciting that probably during this time we had a lot of people joining online, but were they engaged and how do we continue to keep people engaged and want to keep coming um, back? And are we engaging and getting new people because they have the opportunity to hop from church to church online? So I did a whole blog about that. Um, all right, let me go to the next. Any other questions before I go on? All right, continuing into opening safely. I literally just cut and paste all of this information again um, in that um, um, from uh, Jim who listed this. He did a series right before, um, I mean, not right before, I'm trying to think, it may have been, he's part of, it's part of the blog, it was a separate blog, but you know, returning to your building, what to look for. He actually did this twice and it's really, he did it at the beginning when churches start closing because there were things you needed to do to your church to prepare it to be closed for an extensive or unknown time. And then basically reverse, same thing, doing the same thing when you go back um, to open. And so um, those things are listed here, um, turning on all of your faucets, um, that is important. Flushing the toilets. Draining your water heater would be preferable, but if you can. If not, then you need to turn on your hot water for at least 20 minutes. Uh, refilling floor drains, and actually there was specific in how to do that. A quart of water to a teaspoon of vegetable oil, because the vegetable, without that, the vegetable oil helps to it, it evaporate and smooth through the pipe system. So. Um, changing, obviously, that should be done um, nor in normal times, changing your filters and inspecting your AC units. Um, oftentimes, maybe churches don't do that, and then they get into that blessing, that curse of your building because upkeep was not kept up. But And then look at hands-free faucets and doors. Actually, it is relatively inexpensive um, to do both of those items. Um, I have visited, and I know for sure, uh, Outback, because I visit that to um, celebrate, I can't remember which, um, which day it was, but a family member for 
um, their birthday. And uh, Outback has little, whatever you call those, little silver little plates where you can literally take your feet and open up the, the door with your foot. Um, and then obviously hands-free um, faucets. And so there, those little plates are things you can actually get from Lowe's or Home Depot and are not that expensive to add to your doors for people to open um, in opening up. Or obviously, you know, some of the places that I have visited is a lot of the places are, it's just they have their doors propped open. But um, we're talking less than usually 1500 to make any of those things kind of happen. And then obviously you want to be making an announcement. And what do I mean by that is people want to know if, obviously if you have been on your, your smartphones, TV, um, internet, any place, social media, you have seen company after company after company have um, done, talked about what it looks like to, um, that they're doing to prepare their, uh, prepare their, their, their place of business for your safety. That will be important for the church to do as well, because people want to know that the church has considered that and that when they go, that they are going to be um, as safe as possibly um, that, that you, they can be because the church has prepared for that. So you want to be making those announcements on your website, um, sending those out, however you are communicating to your church currently now as a whole, so that they are aware that these are the things that we are doing and these are the things that you can expect. All right, any questions around that? Let me move on to the next slide. Church differently. What does that look like? So obviously during COVID time, um, there are two ways we can actually do ministry uh, or even not doing COVID time. But as we look at, we have to do church differently. We look at doing what we call ministry old style and ministry new style. Doesn't mean old style is bad. Um, because actually COVID may have been a blessing in taking us back to old style. And what I mean by that is, um, you know, one of the things when I was little, when I grew up in our church first, uh, we was planning a new church. We started in home with six to eight members. And so having that intimate relationship and understanding and knowing your members. So going back to those smaller uh, worship times because I know I have some churches out there that are actually doing um, they do several mini services intimately because not everyone can get online and so they're doing it via phone and things like that and being creative um, using zoom but using the phone feature um, to still be able to include those people um, and then um, some churches are um, are so big um, that you know again um, as I said before, is you're able to do social distancing um, in the 300 seat, as a 300 seat comparative I used before with 50 members. So let me uh, kind of go through each one separately. So let's talk about ministry old style. And this is at the, in the back as well. Um, from Christianity Today and particularly the May issue, and I have the link to that in my resources, um, they, they outlined a lot of things, but I kind of took the first three things that they mentioned in there uh, in doing ministry old style, you know, being missional, um, small group gatherings and things like that. And then also meeting social needs, uh, going back to some churches have got, had gotten away from that and meeting social needs, meeting emotional needs, and then obviously spiritual needs of our members and our community. And then also looking at our church really as a, um, looking at our church really as a hospital. You know, old style is, you know, everyone come to the hospital, you, you sick, you get your medicine, you get your IV, I'm using analogies if you have not figured that out. And so basically you get well after going to the hospital but it's just internal. Um, and then you go out. So going old style is just being internal. I, I got filled, I'm good. 
And so now I'll be good for the rest of the week and I can be able to do this all over again next week. Um, that's kind of old style philosophy where we want to go to the hospital, get well, and, but we also want to then be filled so that we can go out and do the gospel outside. So um, I want to go to the next one for new style. All right, various ways and new style is to, we talked about the drive-in, won't we'll go into that again. And then um, is basically with new style, it's not about the number of people attending your church, but more the number of people that you serve in your community. Um, whether it's online engagement, whether it's discipleship in your neighborhoods or the E-word evangelism um, or community involvement. And I think I heard someone saying some things that they were doing some things out in their community and inviting people. You know, social media and Facebook. Uh, one of the things is with Zoom, um, some people are using GoToMeeting, some are doing Google Hangout, um, Skype for Business, teams there's all different ways to to do church differently now and many of our churches have done that uh, one of the biggest things um is yes churches has been affected from online uh, from not being in person and people giving but churches who pivoted to online giving may see five percent or things just being the same and one of the things between june and august when normally uh, June and August when normally people have their offerings generally is down during that time. What we are hearing, um, all of the advisors who are out in their various different um, zones is hearing that churches are staying even and status quo because now they have the option to do online giving. And so um, I know for a fact, some of my churches have not pivoted to that and they are hurting. And so they, they're not doing givelified, they're not doing tithely, faith living giving, secure give, PayPal, easy give. I mean, all of those are various different, there are num numerous of those. Uh, my church particularly does givelify, um, and a lot of people may be familiar with givelify and tithely, um, but there are different ways that churches can give and text to give is another popular one that I actually didn't put that one on there. And it's relatively expensive. If someone gives $20 to the church, the church gets $19.90 or $19.83. So the church is not losing money by someone giving. And then giving is up. You people are able to give online, whether they're in Alaska, which no one's going there now, but or, or whether they are actually in church. So um, that's doing church different and looking at that. So I encourage um, people who have not done that to, um, to really look into that. Community church is different. So being a community church, and you know, I have a few ch churches I want to kind of highlight, um, have done blood drives. Um, I think I've heard some about, I don't remember who told me, something, one of the people were saying they did lunches. Um, community Worship Center in Gardenia, California did brown bag lunches um, for people. In, in their community. Um, First Christian Church in Portland did food banks um, in their community. Urban Sanctuary um, did delivering meals where they delivered meals not only to the sick and shut in, but um, to people who just wanted um, a meal to be delivered to them. Of course, now uh, Grubhub, if you've heard of that, or DoorDash has been very popular with people ordering meals and a high, not a high, I shouldn't say high, but um, you pay a delivery fee or um, a tip um, in order for that to, to happen. But with this church, they were able to deliver meals to people, go get those meals and deliver it to them. And of course, they wasn't charging them and then giving them literature um, uh, about their church. So, and then of course, um, as we always do as churches, you know, doing food, food uh, banks, um, food, not food banks, but food banks, community feeding outside, helping the homeless and, um, and addic addicted uh, communities. So those are just some, some, um, some things that 
churches have done. Finally, I just want to say one last thing about community church is co-sharing your space is now, um, especially if your church is one of those churches that is too big, you only use it once or twice a week when we were back. Um, how can you maximize that space to be used seven days a week? And co-sharing is a great way to do that with social services. And I think um, I'm going to talk about that next. I can't remember. I can't see the next slide. So I want to see if anyone has any questions around that. And then I'm going to bring up an audience poll. All right. Uh, what ways, this is an audience poll, if you can put it in the chat um, or you can speak out as well. What ways has your church done things differently uh, during COVID? And Chris, I'm gonna need your help again if anyone answers. Will do. Julie mentioned a few minutes ago that Eastwood was going to do an outside Vesper service, but it might get rained out. So they'll do a 30 minute walk through communion oh, instead. Okay. All right. If you could want to share, st still please put it in the chat, some ways that your church has done some things differently. I kind of yeah. mentioned some churches in there, so I we want us to few. learn from each other. Okay, go ahead. Deborah says Central Memphis has Sunday church and Wednesday Bible study online and has never done that before. Julie, wow. worship videos, Zoom meetings for all groups and committees, communion delivery. Mara, FCC Cleveland has begun snack packs to local schools, which is still in session. Methodist Church is doing Sunday evening service with Bring Your Own Lawn Chair. Bob, FCC Chattanooga is doing online worship every Sunday. We also, we have also done home delivery of communion. We do a coffee time for 30 minutes every Sunday on Zoom. Clyde, our worship experience is online at 1030 and at four at Mississippi Boulevard. We do all virtual Christian education online, which is new, Zoom meetings wow. for all ministries, et cetera. Um, Dennis, my computer crashed. Um, I will get back to him. I'll, I'll write Dennis. Okay. I just thought of something. Um, I want to share this. Um, my church, um, which I said is relatively, not as big as Mississippi Boulevard, but relatively a big church. And so obviously getting to you know over 2,000 members um, can be difficult. And one of the things that we did um, that I share whenever I have an opportunity is what we call church in a box. Um, and if you visit our website, you will see, it talks about that a lot. And we, we put out, send out announcements when we're, when we're doing it and you, literally they come by. But of course, it's people putting together that church in the box and the things that are included in that. Um, and we also take the church in the box to people who can't come. But what's included in that is uh, we have always taped our services. Um, and so we provide CDs for people and DV, uh, DVDs for them to watch our services. So we, that's in the box. We have communion, individual communion in the box. Uh, we have, it, this varies. Sometimes we may have candle. Sometimes we may have just something to kind of lift their spirit uh, a cross or a bookmark or something like that just to lift people's spirits. And then, of course, we have um, tithing envelopes. If people just are not doing anything online, they don't do, uh, even though we offer online giving, they um, choose not to do that for whatever reason. And so uh, ways for them. And then we, in the tithe envelopes, um, which can be costly, but in the tithe envelope, but keeping in mind that as a tax exempt, you actually get bulk rating, which most of you probably already knew that. Um, but we do a self-addressed stamped envelope for them to actually be able to mail it um, to us and not have to incur a cost or worry about getting stamps or anything like that. So we make it very convenient. And so we put that in our, in our church in the box and it switches up. We've done it now since COVID. We've been what, six months, seven months in this. We've probably done it um, over 14 times. So usually twice a month, we will, will do that. So I just wanted to share another creative ideal um, um, of something that our church has done during COVID. All right. 
looking at our building. Let me bring this in. So um, uh, give me a second. Let me lower you down. I opened it back up so I could see people. So looking at your building, how does your building allow um, you to serve the needs of your community? Is your building allowing you to serve your community? And then can you... Can your mission be done in your building? Um, and so um, this is just something um, we, we like to bring up at Disciples Church Extension Fund because we obviously offer a service um, in which we are able to um, help through our hope services for people to begin to look at their community and their building differently. You know, looking at your demographics in your area. You know, one time we had a church, we did this for that said, we want to be able to have families and small children and um, to come to our church. Well, their demographics show within a 10 mile radius, um, of course there are families there, but the demographics were made up mostly of seniors. They were surrounded by a senior um, living home and things like that. And so having families and young children as one of your ministry doesn't mean you can't do that, but you would be going outside of your community to do that. And that demographic service that we gave them was able to help them to identify that. So they actually became a senior service um, in doing things for the seniors out of their, um, out of their building and began to retrofit their building to be able to do that by setting up um, equipment that they uh, partnered with social services. And this is a church out of, uh, Michigan that did this. Actually out of Flint, Michigan, uh, where that would not normally have happened, but they were able to, to do that. And um, it's not about growing your church, but they were able to engage their community and people come to their church and help their church uh, because of them being able to offer that. And so, um, but I just identifying those community needs, list, uh, visiting local services groups, attending because um, people always ask us, how can we know how, what our community need? And so, excuse me, oftentimes I say, you know, there are service social services group. You can look those up in your area and they would love it when churches reach out to them and say, you know, we want to be able to partner with you. What are you seeing the needs in our area or attending school board meetings, especially if you're wanting to um, have a mission and ministry around children, attending those school board meetings so you can get to know those parents, get to hear those concerns in those meetings and see how your church may be able to effectively be able to help your community. Attending chamber meetings, not necessarily to mix politics and church, but in those chamber meetings, you find out what, what, are, what people are angry about, what they're upset about, what they need, what they say, you know, can we be able to do? And the church can often feel that fill those needs. So just getting to know that, getting to know your district uh, representative. Um, so those are just some samples of how you can be engaged in your community, find out what they need, find out what they need, but also matching that to your passion in ministry. Because again, if you are a senior church and you can't stand children running around, you're not going to have a passion for inviting kids in to have Girl Scout, Boy Scouts in your church. So also knowing what your mission is um, as a, a church as well. All right, we almost there. Almost there. Literally two slides. So I just thank you guys. I appreciate you hanging with me. So let me go on. I just want to talk about real quick. Um, I would be behooved not to, um, uh, to not have mentioned who we are and what we do. I didn't want to start off doing that, um, um, but I wanted to be able to, to share. So who, who are we? That's our website again. That is the blog right there again. So literally right now with it up on the screen, you can actually click on that and you, it would bring up all of our blogs. Um, I think someone had asked about that. And so hopefully you were able to get that. But let me uh, click on... One of the things that we definitely do is that we help churches to plan, create a plan. Um, we do that through our initial consultations, through our building planning services, through our relocation plan service. So some churches relocate because um, their, their ministry, the community they're in, no longer matches their ministry, 
or their church is too big and they need to have a building that right sizes where they are at or vice versa, they're growing and busting at the seams. So we help in planning that. So we help churches to set their vision, to plan it, and then to create action and what that looks like around it in order to be successful. Obviously, you know that we do loans. And so we do loans anywhere from renovating, which are the majority of the loans that we do, um, probably have done at least in my nine years um, that I have done, because there are some churches who are building from the ground up, but there are not a lot of churches that are doing that. Uh, but obviously we do property purchase, we repurpose, um, help you. I talked about, you know, once you realize what your mission and ministry is, we have helped churches to repurpose their space. Um, to fit their ministry. And we have a ton of stories on our website in various churches that we have done that for. Obviously, we refinance. Sometimes our churches don't know about us. And as I'm getting to know Tennessee, because I've only been serving you for a year, so I was really looking forward to having an in-person regional assembly so that I can get to know you personally in the churches. Um, but there are a lot of churches didn't even know a church bank, I call it a church bank, existed. And so they are local with their local bank um, and, and would, would have came to us if they would have known about us. So we do do those refinances and obviously we do construction. I had mentioned earlier too about special projects. Um, so we have done, we have created special, well, we always do special projects, but we've created audio visual and technology upgrade and equipment um, loans, very low, uh, loans and doing at like 2.75% um, and then able to make payments on that, uh, not make payments or pay interest for a month to help churches to get their technology up and going. So if you want to hear more about that, I am more than happy to talk with you um, about that. Um, obviously, we do facility assessments. I talked about Jim Michael, who is our building um, uh, eval evaluation coordinator. We do our building evaluations through our facility um, assessment. And then um, we would not be able to do any of this. Oops, I clicked off of all of that. Sorry. If we did not do investments. And so we offer investment notes. Um, and that's actually how we operate. Uh, we don't receive DMF money. We, um, we, we get people who want to invest with us in a savings account or a CD, although technically I'm not supposed to call it that. It's called investment notes. Um, and from that, when people invest with us, we take that money and that's how we're able to actually do the services and loans that we provide. And then from our loans and the interest that is charged on that, we actually pay back our investors. And that's how our actually Disciples Church Extension Fund economic engine uh, works. And just a shameless plug while I'm here is we are running an investment um, promo because our needs are great right now. Churches are needing our help. And so we are needing money to be able to help our churches. Um, and we do that through investments. And so we are offering a 2% promotion with $2,500 um, in new money for a 12 month term. So just a shameless plug. Sorry. I have the floor. And then uh, fundraising, we help, obviously, our churches run fundraising. Now, I am going to literally pat, our, pat ourselves on the back because we have, and we've been in existence now since 1883, so over 137 years, if I did my math correctly, and we have a 95% success rate that we have been able to help our churches fundraise and meet the goals that they have set for their fundraising. So if you have never done fundraising with us, um, and even more important during this time, we are a great partner to partner with in doing that. So let me get to our resource page and I'm gonna leave this up for a minute. You um, are welcome to take a picture of this if you want to. Again, like I said, it was being recorded. So it is, um, you will have access to this. These are live links, so you actually can um, click on those. The only thing that I did not mention in ours is I talk, I did not talk about the frequently um, FAQ, you see that, like the third one down. Um, and I didn't talk about disciples in COVID either, so give me a second, I'll tell you about that. Uh, but the frequently asked questions, 
Um, there is a church, First Christian Church in Iowa City that I thought did a wonderful job in outlining what to expect, how they're doing their building and all of that. So I think it is a perfect document for churches who have not opened, which is the majority of you, to click on that link. Um, and actually you can see it's a Word document and you can begin to put that together. I obviously have shared that even with my husband who serves on our building committee um, to, um, to do that. So it has a wealth of information. I just think the pastor did a wonderful job in doing that. So I, um, share, I am sharing that. So the other thing that I did not mention, I talked about the signage, this is where you can click and get the free templates, is the Disciples in COVID. If you go to our main um, website page, disciples.org, there are all, it is all 12 of our ministries and then some are feeding into this link of whether there's grants to help you in your church, whether there's special loans, whether those are special devotions, um, anything around COVID. Um, to help our churches, there are links, um, there are all kinds of resources on that page. And it is a working document from where it started in March to where it is now. It has, um, it was things out there for when people was trying to do um, PPP or payment protection, some churches took advantage of that. And now churches are preparing that I don't want to have to pay this back and I wanted to get the giving. How do I do that? And so there's things out there about that. So that has a wealth of information as well. All right, I am going to stop and ask, I know I went over 15 minutes or what I wanted to do, although they, they gave me two hours, but I wanted to, I wanted to try to keep it in an hour, but any questions and answers, I want us to take the time to, uh, I want to be able to take the time to really um, answer those for you. Linda, there was a question from Mara that said, what about rural churches who have members who refuse to wear masks? <clears throat> I know one has begun a second service for masks only. Any, that, any advice for Mara? That is a very hard question, but it's a very realistic question. In, and it comes up, I won't say a lot, but it comes up quite a bit. Um, it's just, to be honest, the thing is about helping the people with the mask. Really, we have shared, and we even in our organization and um, Disciples of Christ, uh, Christian Church Disciples of Christ, our main um, OGMP office is saying we have the right to say, unfortunately, we can't, we have to look at the safety of all, and wearing your mask helps others to be safe, in addition to helping you to to be safe and you know it's having those conversations possibly with that person one-on-one -on -one, um what we found unfortunately is some of it is political and so they are making a stance from that standpoint but churches who have um have been successful has really been identifying in the pastor or the elders or deacons really finding out what is it um that it that that person does not why they don't want to have their mask and having those conversations because oftentimes it's really not about um the mask and so some people can't wear masks like if they have asthma or breathing problems they can't do that and um so churches have done provisions around that for the few that have open or at least considering open is having a section social distance apart, six feet, maybe even actually I've heard even 10 feet apart for those particular uh, people who cannot, who just cannot wear a mask for a 30 or uh, 45 minute time uh, during a, a service. So um, I know that may not be a lot of help, but I hope I answered a little bit um, of your question for you. What other questions? And you can put them in the chat. This is not so much a question as just an observation and, and maybe a little bit of an explanation. We are one of the churches that um, reopened with extreme, um, extremely well-defined procedures and restrictions. Uh, and we did that um, about two months ago now. And- uh, Wow. Uh, it was in July, late July, so 
maybe not quite two months, maybe six or seven weeks, but it's, it's getting close. Anyway, um, number one, th there, there are no exceptions to our restrictions. Everybody wears a mask. And I have had people tell me they have breathing problems or COPD and a mask is inconvenient. And lovingly and pastorally, I've said, well, you don't need to be here even if you could wear a mask. If, if you already have compromised uh, breathing, you, you, you don't need to be here anyway. And so that's why we've been, that's why we've spent lots of money making sure that we are uh, streaming a service as high quality as we possibly can. I mean, we've bought equipment and switchers and webcam, uh, 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 a, a web broadcaster, things that I'd never heard of before. We have raised the money and bought so that we could make it um, almost like being at church to be at home. So we have about 25 to 30 people in two separate services with the vast majority watching at home, but somewhere around 25 to 30 counting musicians, pastors, and we're not using any lay leaders or acolytes or anything like that. Um, in, in a place that will seat 225 to 250. And um, our reason for doing that in, in July, some of our parents were gonna send their kids back to in-school school. Several of our people were eating occasionally in restaurants. I, I don't, I haven't had a restaurant meal. I, mean, I do, but we get it take out. Um, but, our board and our staff agreed that people are beginning to explore acceptable risks if they can keep them at a minimum. And we decided a church service would be one of those. If they feel safe sending their kids to school or playing sports, um, as long as they're not exposed. Now, last week, we had one person here asymptomatic, but on Tuesday, she found out she was positive. Uh, we found the three people who came closest to her. One of them was a staff member. They think they were six to eight feet away, but we have asked them not to come to church this week, including a minister who was supposed to do communion this Sunday. Uh, we're, we, we have no exceptions to our rules. And, and, and so when people say they don't want to wear a mask, I say, watch from home. We'd love to have you at 10 or 11 uh, and the streaming service and w our board and it's helped that our board is united in this our board said these are the rules for reopening we accepted the cdc and the local shelby county i'm in memphis local shelby county health department guidelines for reopening churches and we just made them non-negotiable and it actually has gone well until last sunday and i just got one of the staff members uh just texted me just now uh, she got her COVID results this morning and she is clear. Um, we've already taken her out of the service for tomorrow, but, but, but she can be back in the office on Monday. So, you know, I, I think it, it depends on every congregation, but um, if you can get a haircut and, and you can go to a restaurant and do that safely, you can probably go to church too safely. You've just got to be really intentional about it and you can't get lax. Absolutely. Ron, thank you so much. You just said a lot of things and very important. Um, and so thank you so much for sharing that and, and telling us those comments. And hopefully that was not only helpful to you, Mara, but to, to others. So um because it's just you just one of the two who were doing i think it's you and mara the only two that were originally said on the phone that you you were open so um any other questions or comments uh, belinda could I, you had, could I ask ron to elaborate on what his church does following these services in the way of cleaning or prepping for uh, other events or the following week? How, how is that done? Uh, we're really not having other events here. We're beginning to explore that with 10 or fewer. Um, but uh, our, our custodial hours and procedures changed when we resumed having services. So they come in I don't know exactly what cleaning chemicals they use, but all of the chairs 
and um, our, our wipe down every doorknob. We're only using a small part of the building. The mm -hmm. classrooms and educational wing, all that is off limits. Nobody goes there. I walk through there a couple of times a week to check things, but nobody uses those rooms. So our custodians clean the area before the service on Sunday and wipe down everything. Nobody has used it. Um, nobody's really been in there in a couple of days before that, but we wipe it down. On Sunday morning, even if it's raining, even if it's hot, we open all the doors that people will have to open. So nobody's touching a door. Um, uh, those doors are sanitized too, but you can't sanitize between every person that walks in. So what we do early on Sunday morning is we, we only have one set of bathrooms we're using because we're only having 25 or 30 people in the building at a time. So we go to one set of the men's and women's restrooms that all have stalls and we open those doors before the service. So people are not touching the restroom door coming in or out. Um, we have hand sanitizer anywhere in the building that you could be. You're never over three steps from hand sanitizer. And, um, but a thorough cleaning on Saturday, a thorough cleaning on Monday. Um, and then we take everybody's temperature as they come in the door and they have to be wearing a mask and they have to put on hand sanitizer as they come in. And we have somebody hold that bottle. So not everybody's touching the hand sanitizer. Uh, my teenage granddaughter is one of the volunteers sometimes on Sunday that either takes the temp or um, um, uses the hand sanitizer. And we have no minors, she's, she's 18. Uh, we have nobody under 16 coming to service. Um, so those are some of the precautions that we're taking. Belinda, yes. you had indicated earlier that the, um, <clears throat> excuse me, the links were live. They were not. Uh, are they available yeah. on, on the Disciples uh, website? They are, well, some of them are. Um, let me go back. So, They're not live on the on the screen because the screen is just an image. I think if you want the live link, I think you have to go to the website. Well, usually you people have been able to click on it and actually do it. But I had some questions in there, and I'm gonna bring this up real quick. Um, oh, let me go here, and then I'm a. Um, I don't know if you took a picture of the actual. Um, of the actual resource page. And if you didn't, I can go back. But this is my contact information. Um, because normally when I do workshops, people register and then I could just send to people who register. So this is my information, my email, where you can email me and I can send you out um, that page and those links live through, it, through an email. And then I will go back um, to, to the resource page if anybody needs that, if you want to take a picture of that. Thank you. I'm gonna give you a minute. Any other questions? I'm gonna leave this up just for a minute so people can write this down, but. You guys have been awesome. Thank you so much. I apologize so much for all of the technology um janice is my witness we got it right when i did something with her so i do know how to do it <laughs> and i've done these i mean i'm doing webinars probably who usually at least once every week or every other week and obviously now october november december i'm going to be doing a whole lot because all the regions are having their virtual regional assembly so um, so I apologize, not sure what happened with that. Satan didn't want us to hear what was going to happen, but to God be the glory, we made sure that it got done anyway. So, uh, but thank you guys. Thank you for hanging in there. Thank you for putting suggestions in the chat. Um, I just appreciate you and I cannot wait until I am able to um, see you in person and see your churches. I'm trying to go back. Um, I was trying to go back to the resource page, but I guess I don't know what I did. So, um, so that I can give you guys that. Did, did everyone get um, the, get the actual contact information from me that needed it or wanted it? I am going to see if I can just share the resource page one more time because not everything that's on there. Can you see that? 
Can you see the resource page? Okay. Yes. I have you expanded now so I can see everybody's face and I can't see. Okay. So um, the CD, if you actually go to our website um, in the blog one that was um, in my contact information, you will be able to get to this. You will be able to get to this one. Um, the dis you'll be able to get to the CDC guidelines. You'll be able to get to the disciples in COVID. You'll be able to get to the free COVID signage template. You will not be able to get to the frequently asked, but if you type in icdisciples.org or Iowa City Disciples, it'll bring it up. Uh, First Christian Church, Iowa City, it will bring that up. And then the Christianity Today, um, this is their website. This particularly goes to that issue directly, but you can just type in Christianity Today. And actually that's a great read. They come out with all types of articles. Um, so if you had never, not that they're paying me to say this, but if you um, want to have another source of just reading things you like doing that, that's a, this is a great magazine to, to do that from, so. All right. Any, any other questions or comments? Anything um, anyone else want to share to others? Well, all right. Thank you guys so much again for spending your Saturday with me and I look forward to seeing you live and in person sometime soon and be safe and, and continue to do the ministry and work that you guys do for your communities.